I know we're live. I should start though, right? Okay. Hi, <laughs> everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ophelia Wadahamaji Corliss. Um, I am a member of the Havasupai tribe. And probably about five or six years ago, um, I interned here myself at the Museum of Northern Arizona. So I'm very comfortable here, uh, very honored that uh, the museum keeps me in mind uh, for some of their uh, talks or events. So very happy about that and also thankful. So um, today I was able to go into the special collections um, at the Easton Collection Center. Uh, it's across the street from the museum here in Flagstaff, Arizona. And they have many Havasupai items that they house here at the museum. I picked out some groupings of different types of items. And mostly I'll be speaking about, they call it utilitarian, uh, utilitarian uses. Pretty much that means uh, usable items. So for instance, and um, I'll log on and off with this later. Here is a cradle board. Uh, we use cradle boards. Um, you know, as we speak, there are babies in cradle boards. And so us using this cradle board um, is considered utilitarian. And I have this basket here that my aunt made. Um, maybe in the past, we might have winnowed some seeds with this, but instead, uh, I have it on my wall as decoration. So this would be considered non-utilitarian. So no longer in use or not being used. So I'm gonna go ahead and move over to the presentation here. So uh, cultural connections, Havasupai holdings uh, with myself, Ophelia Wadahamaji Corliss. These items are housed some of them are on display in the Ethnology Gallery, while others are being held inside the Easton Collection Center. So this first item here um, is a, it's a water container. Here are a couple different views of the same item. And welcome to the first water bottle. <laughs> Maybe this is what some of our therbuses and uh, everything we use today. Um, this is a, an original type. So as you can see here where the handles are, um, it is most definitely a basket. Um, this was uh, created and started as a basket. And um, this gloss that you see over the basket is um, pinyon pitch, so sap. It was covered in sap uh, and basically the same idea as ceramics um, is the same idea behind this pitch. You cover the basket in it and you fire it. Uh, you fire it up to a certain temperature, but you know, you just keep it in there for some time. And the idea is that it hardens up um, and seals the basket to a point where it's able to contain water. Here is a, another type of a water jug that is housed here inside the collections. And you'll notice that this one uh, where the handles are is probably yucca that was braided together uh, to make a sort of rope or uh, something you could put over your shoulder, something that was much easier to carry, something that being this small, um, more than likely if you're going to the field, maybe possibly going for a longer walk, um, maybe you might have multiples of these um, going on a hunt. I think they're pretty cool and very interesting to me. 
the adaptability of Havasupais over time to come up with the ability um, to house, I mean, to contain water. But um, once again, uh, this is this is a basket. It's a pin, it's pin, it's a pitched basket. So with the pitch being fired, they're able to seal these jugs. Uh, this next item here is also housed and is on display within the museum, a uh, pair of moccasins. They are covered in red ochre and, you know, in a way represent some of our largest trade items. Red ochre and also the deer hide that was tanned with the certain ingredients and the certain steps that were taken to tan hides. The hide actually was white uh, at the end of the process, which is a different than most of the other hides in the area. Because it was white, uh, it was very sought after, was one of our most sought after trade items, as well as red ochre. So these are on display, very fragile pair here. I have not seen too many pairs of moccasins um, come from the tribe, um, but I'm very happy to see um, a pair of them. So next we move in, we're moving into cradle boards. And this is something that we would consider, it's currently still in use today. Um, this particular photograph, I believe, is just dun, 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 this cradle board. This has um, much more detail, as well as this second picture here. So this is the only uh, cradle board, uh, the photograph that I had chosen that's currently housed in special collections. There are uh, other varieties. This one appears to be wrapped in some sort of fabric. There is what appears to be an older cradle board that is in collections that appears to be wrapped in hide. Uh, also appears to have um, some beads hanging from the, the headboard, the circular uh, protected portion. So uh, with the cradle board um, and the circular area here, you don't ever want to put your arm through it. Um, you never want to put your hand through it as a, a respect thing. This essentially is the first tool that is used to protect a child. It is the first thing that they are protected in, wrapped in, but uh, right here, um, you see the strings, and this is where the child will be wrapped inside of within these loops here. Very detailed. Uh, a lot of care goes into making a, a cradle board. So the idea um, also has protection, uh, this headboard here. Um, there is a more famous story with the involving the hearse who had their daughter inside of a cradle board. And as the mule train went by, um, kind of knocked the cradle board out of hand. And as it fell, you see that the head portion um, does not hit the ground, um, did not hit the ground, and that the child was protected. Think about a child who's been in the womb um, and, and they come out, they might have a tendency to want to form back into the fetal position when uh, this cradle bard will be used to help to straighten them out for the next 90 days, actually, um, you know, protect them, keep them safe. Um, also, um, nowadays, it's popular um, to swaddle, uh, wrap the baby in a blanket so that they don't tire themselves out. Um, that idea is also covered inside of this cradle board. This cradle board was made for me by one of my aunties, um, but it's kind of thin, it's kind of small. And um, 
I had another cradle board made for me. It's a little bit bigger. Um, something that I think might be able to hold the baby maybe for a little bit longer. Um, and I was kind of thinking that, um, you know, maybe our children have just kind of gotten a little bigger over time. Um, whether whether that's because of more access to food or, or the foods that are available. So this, um, they had categorized as a, a yucca ax. And every time I see something neat like this, I just like to say, and this is the first ax, you know, at least, at least for us. Uh, same idea is like, this is the original water bottle. This was used uh, for, you know, they say agave, but it was more like yucca. When I think of agave, I think of the goodness, like the 20, 30 foot plants um, um, that I've seen, I think in California. And those, I just have not seen such huge plants like that here in the area. But um, we do have a type of yucca um, or century plant that um, some of the ethnographies that I've been able to go through say it was a food source for us. And this would have been one of the items that we used to um, take that thing apart, uh, get it ready to roast. Um, and moving on to burden baskets. When I see this, I just wanna say it's the original backpack. What I wanna point out with this one is Notice the lack of design. You can see from the left picture, this burden basket has been used and used very lovingly. The next burden basket as well was used, but has some design on it. This leather strap connected to the burden basket, um, you would flip this upside down uh, and I would put this leather strap over my forehead and, and that's where I would carry it. And let's say I go out looking for wood or I go out to the field and I'm putting the wood that I find in there uh, to carry it with me. My job is to find the wood by the end of the day while I'm using this burden basket uh, to carry that wood so I'm not making multiple trips. The leather um, that is bound, which would technically be the bottom of the basket, that's to secure the bottom. Um, you can imagine of the many things that this was used to carry, uh, the corn that was picked. What I tried to do with these photographs is go from the least to decorated items, which are usually the items that we used. And as time went on and the community had to figure out how to survive within this monetary system, it was discovered that outsiders would purchase these items. And you'll see um, that this particular burden basket has a little more design on it that these outsiders were pretty interested in these baskets and suddenly they became a wanted item any type of basket i've seen so many shapes and designs and types of basket and the reason i put them in this order is because the baskets that you run across if they're highly decorated they're more non-utilitarian they're made for consumption, for decoration. And that is how the Havasupai ended up adapting their basketry over time to try to keep up with money, to understand that goods needed to be purchased or that the outsiders were expecting them to be purchased. I have no doubt that there was still some ability in, in trade, but the brand new expectation was with money. A very lovely large basket. Um, you can see on the outside here on the left, it has a double end here. 
maybe for security. Um, a lot of supai baskets in the 1900s to 1920 um, are actually known for their simplistic design. And so this, this one has a little more design on it. It doesn't have the headband yet, but could have fallen off. And that is a pattern that I was hoping to achieve with some of these groupings of baskets in this presentation is to let it become aware that supai baskets have always been simply designed and that in the beginning when the outsiders started uh, documenting uh, history or writing ethno ethnographies or seeming to think in their own mind um, that they needed to document as much as possible because we would soon be assimilated, that those baskets at those times were very simple. It was not a concept of the habit supai to be making a basket to sell it. All of these were utilitarian. All of these were used for a purpose. So um, this was our backpack. This was, I don't know, maybe our purse, uh, however you want to look at it. Um, this next photograph of something um, is a, a what people use to brush their hair with. Uh, there are a couple of these uh, that are housed here at the museum. Very cool, if you ask me, coming up with, with the idea on how to be able to brush your hair or at least untangle it. Sometimes that wind down in the canyon, I have a hard time just using a modern brush. <laughs> being able to get it back through. So this was just kind of tied together here. They might have braided together some yucca uh, to make the rope. So within the presentation, I tried to use some items to break up burden baskets or coil baskets or winnowing baskets. Baskets are something the Habitsupai were renowned for. You may have heard of pomo baskets. They're very decorative, very colorful, and they use feathers. And some of the documentation that I've been able to go through in some of my education would compare the tight stitching of Havasupai basket to the quality of some pomo made baskets. And in 1920, uh, basket making in Havasupai was bigger than it is today. It's probably, I guess, the golden age of basket making. The community adapted and realized to make money to buy their goods that outsiders really wanted these baskets. And the basket makers of that time were really perfecting their craft. Once again, sticking with simplistic styles the Havasupai were known for but the tight stitching um, that they'd have, they'd have an increment of measurement um, and supais could reach about 16 to 18 stitches within that. And that was considered fine. While some of the Pomo basket, their stitches could reach from 18 up to 22. And individuals interested in studying baskets at the time, to them, uh, have a supai baskets were right up there of the highest quality, uh, very sought after. I would not be surprised of how many museums across the world contain Havasupai baskets that I'm unaware of, but um, Havasupai baskets were very sought after. So here we have a basket starting out with a very simple, simplistic design here. The, the stitching is quite fine. When I was going through collections, um, one of the neat things is some of the baskets, the details that come with it, some of these baskets have names to them, the basket maker. And this particular basket was made by my great, great, great grandmother. And she was known as a basket maker on the Equala side of the family. And, you know, I had been in and out of this museum a few times, even the special collections portion, and I had not ever recollected seeing the name of the basket makers until this last time. But if you uh, look at the design on the outside of the basket, 
those could represent mountains, but if you look at the inside of the basket, you know, I would be tempted to say that that's a sunflower. So it's the ability to decipher what a design is, is to keep in mind that it could possibly be a handful of things um, when a basket is so old or when um, documentation wasn't as important in a certain time era when what was more important was getting the baskets because they might have believed that that culture would no would cease to exist soon. So it was about quantity, not necessarily quality of descriptions, uh, quality of the basket maker, um, quality of the story behind that particular basket. So you will, depending on the museum you go to, will find an array of different kind of um, techniques that were used in docu documentation in, in, in basketry and through any artifacts. So certain, certain techniques were used at certain times, um, certain, the idea of rushing for quantity, at a certain time was more important than who made the basket, what's the story behind the basket, and what the design is. So sometimes it's left up to your interpretation. So when I talk about, you know, the 1920s and basket makers, even, even later, um, and there are still basket makers in the canyon, this is the only basket that's in this particular presentation that has any color. Uh, I think that is more specifically for the purchaser um, and the aesthetics of the basket. Um, this basket, um, an, another finely stitched basket, is also on display within the museum. This is not a swastika. This is a symbol called Thimsalga. This is also represented on the same basket, corn. So this basket uh, means quite a lot to me. I have a lot of, of my own personal tattoo designs based on Thimsalka. And I came to the Heritage Festival this last weekend and I was sitting in the chair inside the Ethnology Gallery and I had flipped open um, one of the smaller interpretations of design um, and had flipped it to a page um, in quotes um, that, that spoke about, quote, the swastika. And uh, a family, a generational family, grandpa, father, son, uh, had walked up to it. And I'm listening to them talk about this symbol and how is it not the Nazi swastika? No, said one of them. Um, the Nazi swastika goes the other way. And so I'm going to flip back to this photograph. This is the photograph that's used in that particular display. And you can see it only goes one way in this photograph, you know, and I watched this family look up a Nazi swastika on Google, on their phone, and say, huh, they're going the same way. That particular display might need an update with a photograph such as this, because I want you to know that Fim Salka cannot be contained in, 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 in one direction. That particular photograph that's being used is containing it to one direction, when that is absolutely not what this symbol represents. You see on the outside of the basket, it's going one direction, while on the inside of the same basket, it's going the other direction. This is a very fluid symbol for the community. It is not a swastika. Uh, this symbol represents uh, when we all used to be one people um, in the canyon, and that starts from the middle of this symbol. And when we couldn't get along and we couldn't live together anymore, the condor came down and picked up many people on its back, uh, flew out of the Grand Canyon, and would drop those people off. Both, I, I will say, dropped off people into these four directions first, where they were let off of the wing and walked into that direction, where they later would settle the land that they now take care of our brother and sister tribes out here on the plateau until the people were continued to be let off the wings within these directions. 
there's more than these directions that are represented on this basket. And those are our brother and sister tribes from when we all used to be one tribe who were led off in all those different directions. And when we used to be one and couldn't be together anymore, and these were the directions that that fell apart into those people, the people of the Colorado Plateau. This symbol is very significant. And the other symbol, corn here, is a very important food line for us. And supai corn is very important to the tribe. Corn and gardening is very important to the tribe. This basket represents a, a lot of what encompasses very important aspects of the Havasupai just within this basket. And we're moving on to something else I really thought was cool. Um, you know, what might be considered uh, winnowing baskets or parchment trays. And this first one here definitely looks used. And um, it looks like ash to me, but I also had this suspicion that much like the water jugs that were pinion pitched, cooked, um, able to, to be used, um, that uh, Havasupai has also had cooking trays. You know, I was really looking for something more of a cooking tray. You know, I had my suspicions. So we went down into the display and I got a close up photograph and you can see that it, there is some stuff smeared into here is that like old food what is that is that ashes and I I could promise that we had found some bright crystallized uh, pieces of pitch so you know we moved on to some other types of this basket and I'm still looking for the same thing I'm looking for a cooking tray not necessarily a parchment tray so this one's used also and this is the back of it yeah, you know, like this design is no longer showing through the front because of how used it was. So you can see, is that ash stuck in there? Is that food stuck in there? What is it? So um, these are some pictures I took myself. And so here's some of the detail and also um, the double end basket there uh, for stability. And here's the inside of the basket. And right there in the center is some more pinion pitch. And I got a, a close up of that. And so um, there are some baskets here uh, within the museum, you know, in my eyes to say and to prove that we also had cooking baskets, uh, much on the same idea of pitch when it's heat, heated and cooked well enough, hot enough. It, it turns into a ceramic that, that you can use and that we use to cook some items here. So cooking baskets in my mind existed for the Havasupai. Um, this basket, uh, very deteriorated, um, but is moving along the idea of more design as time went on in order to be purchased. And this basket was very interesting to me. It's hard to say, and I wonder exactly what this basket was used for. There is some food stuck in it, maybe some sap, um, but I wonder what kind of possible ceremonies it might've been used for because of the design that's inside of it. The rest of these baskets um, don't appear to be used, but you can see over time, how the designs have increased, um, increased for purchase. Um, and this one um, we were thinking is a sunflower, the supai sunflowers, and around it, the canyon walls. If you can see the canyon walls within that outside of the basket design there. Uh, very fine, and this is a tray, uh, not necessarily a bowl, but most definitely decorated for purchase. And this was a photograph of the first time I was introduced to special collections. Um, this is some of the other items that we have housed inside of special collections at the in the Easton Collection Center. Uh, I'm in by no means an expert, but hope that maybe there were a few things um, um, that I was able to bring to light, and I hope to learn much, much more during my lifetime. So. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. And um, I'll see you next time.